just may just be aware that you are the any anything you you say on the thing will be recorded and probably be on YouTube. So at some point, um, that's um, but yeah. So what we'll do, we'll do two things. We'll we'll get some OSM data into QGIS, and then we'll do some analysis and visualization. Um, right? It's going to be fairly basic in a, in a lot of ways. I just want to demonstrate sort of what is what you can achieve within a reasonable amount of time and with with very little um, sort of advanced knowledge. That's what this workshop is kind of meant to do. Um, Okay, a quick tour of QGIS. If you have if you've used it before, this might be familiar. Um, some of the some of the some of the basic parts of it of this desktop application are like at the top you'll find a toolbar, right, with all the um, sort of most common tools for interacting with the data, loading data, um, um, creating layers, and all this um, uh, all this kind of uh, jazz. Um, there's a, on the on the left top there's a there's a browser that lets you um, sort of see different sources of data on your own computer or on or on the internet or uh, in a database. Um, we won't use that today, but that's where you usually will go to sort of um, to to kind of manage your data storage, if you will. Um, since we will be querying OSM right from the internet, we won't use that today. Um, then there's the layer list. Um, a GIS is always made out of layers. Like you can you can think that of you can think of that as a sort of different 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 yeah literally different layers of information that can that can be separated and that can also be um, sort of interact with each other in certain ways. So um, this is a great way of organizing your data. Right, for example, you have the base layer that is just a visual layer like a like a like a, like a visual map, and then you can have a layer with buildings. You can have a layer with roads, and all these things can, are usually separated like that. And this is the menu that shows you what what's there. Um, and then one thing that is that is that's going to be very important is where all the sort of all the magic lives, if you will, is the QGIS processing toolbox. Um, if it's not visible, then there is a then there's a, a menu item, uh, and I'll be switching back and forth, I think, between QGIS and uh, and the slides uh, just to just to uh, make sure that we could that we have um, that, that we make this a little interactive. But this is where. A lot of the functions live that that, that let you manipulate data, do calculations on them, etc. Um, okay, let me see if I can effectively switch between QJS and uh, I'm, I'm assuming you can see my QJS um, window right now or application if I switch to that, right? Because I'm sharing yep. my screen. Yeah. Okay. So you can see this here in action. This is my live desktop where I have everything. Um, my screen is quite big, so it might be a little uh, a little small for for you to see. Um, there's not much I can do about that. Um, in fact, maybe I can make this a little bit lower. Is is this is this very small for you guys to see this uh, this interface? It's okay for me. Okay, well, let, I'll leave it like this. If I, I, I could, I could, um, I could mess with the resolution a little bit. Okay, so jumping back and forth between the slides. So first, first thing we'll do, I've talked about plugins a little bit before. Um, we'll install a, um, a, a very powerful plugin that lets you query and load OpenStreetMap data without having to go to OSM and download every, anything. Right? It will just query the OpenStreetMap database live, um, and uh, and um, and uh, and and don't, doesn't require any loading, any downloading um, ahead of time. And we'll guide you through that. So here there's a menu um, plugins in QGIS. Um, and there you can manage and install plugins that you that you want. Um, and it will fetch a uh, will fetch a, a, a list and uh, we can search for the thing that we want quick OSM. I've already installed it, but you can click it here um, and then install it. And then it will just be available to you, and it will add these these two little. Um, can I annotate? Yeah, uh, it will it will add these two little things on your on your uh, on your uh, on your toolbar. I hope I can make this go away too. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can here. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm. This is the first time I'm doing that. Um, so we install this plugin, and what we have then is a, is an interface to OSM basically. Um, after we did that, like so, uh, this is this is jumping around a little bit to organize these chat slides a little differently, probably. 
Um, but the, the first thing I like to do when I start working in a um, uh, in a QGIS project is set an appropriate uh, coordinate reference system or projections. Some some call it it's not exactly the same. This is kind of out of this outside of the scope of this workshop, but it's important to know that you that that you that you uh, that you work in a three D world on a two D map. So there's always going to be um, there's always going to be compromises with a projection, right? Um, it, dis it introduces distortion, basically, in shape, area, distance, and, and direction. Um, there's a whole lot of resources on that um, that you could learn about. What's most important for this workshop, though, is that all these different coordinate reference systems uh, have different units, um, and we want to be able to work in a in a unit that's that's con that's familiar to us. Um, so we we want we want a uh, in our case a meter based coordinate reference system, so we can just enter. Well, meters is kind of, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, so that's very familiar to me, but um, anyone here will kind of know what a meter is, right? It's, it's, uh, whereas if you work in the default coordinate reference system, everything is in degrees, which it can be very hard to reason about. So um, with that out of the way, um, let's start querying some OSM data, right? We'll, we'll, work, with, uh, we'll work with pedestrian uh, foot, footpaths, basically. Um, and and there's uh, we use the the quick OSM plugin to quickly query uh, a small uh, those for a small area, and this is very easy uh, to do in fact. Um, and um, I'll show you show you what that looks like. Um, so you go to the quick OSM plugin, and this will show you a screen that looks like or window that looks like this. Um, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of presets uh, that you can use. Um, that are um, that that let you download small uh, small chunks of data from different categories. Um, you could probably I haven't even looked at this, but you might be able to uh, to yeah. There is actually a, a, a pre preset for foot and cycleways. Um, actually, this one is the one that I want um, for the for the when I was preparing this. I just I just I just um, typed this in by hand. But what that does is it gives you the right what they call tags right in OpenStreetMap world um, for uh, for doing this uh, for doing this analysis. So and then you type a city. I'm going to use my hometown of Salt Lake City, um, and then I will run that query. So it will fetch the data from OpenStreetMap live. So if I made an edit a minute ago, it will be in this in this in the map in the data that I get back. This takes a little bit of time, not too long for for a small area. You couldn't use this on huge areas, right? Um, like I said, QGIS is probably not suitable for um, for uh, for doing uh, uh, for doing work on huge on on huge um, uh, chunks of data. So we're using city size data here. You can see that it's loaded. Um, points and lines, um, because some of the footway things are actually crossings or other footwear related things. We are really only interested in the, um, let me make this go away. Okay, let me just make this a little smaller. I'm sorry, I'm fumbling around here. Um, we're only interested in the, in the, you can see in the layer list, it added a bunch of different layers, actually two, so these two here. Um, we're only interested in the roads, so we're going to disable this one. Um, it's hard; it's very it's very hard to see, but the footways are still there. Um, you can click on one, um, and you can see that they're still there. There's a bunch of tags here related to that. Um, so there we are. We have our base data set that we want to work with, right? Um, so just a, a quick sort of diversion into, into learning about, so we saw that highway equals footway represents footpaths in OSM. There's a lot of detail to be, to be learned about that. The presets helped us in this case, right, by, um, by, by giving us a preset for dedicated footways, um, right? So we, we were just able to use that. If you want a more specific query, then you might have to look into how these tags work. And there's a bunch of resources to learn more about that. That's a very, very deep rabbit hole that you can go into. The most common ones are fortunately easy to learn. All right, um, so now we need to think about aggregating this. Uh, we need to think about how what we want to visualize, right? And what I want to visualize density. So how dense is the um, how dense is the is the is the is the is the foot is the um, the footpath network in Salt Lake City? 
um, then we need a unit of density. So I decided to choose a grid um, to do that. Um, and, and when you do something like that, you think about size, right? What is the grid size that is relevant here? You want it to be appropriate to the scale of your area of interest, um, but it also should have enough enough density of data to be to be meaningful. Like if you have grids that are so that are so small that it only has one or two I items in it, like there's no useful aggregation. Um, but if, you, if it's too big, then you basically only have a few grid cells for each city, and it doesn't tell you very much. Um, so that requires some thinking and perhaps some experimentation. Okay, for the grid, we we used something. We used that processing toolbox that I used that I that I talked about before, um, and um, we are going to type that into the presets. And we're going to do uh, we're going to type grid, um, and you'll see that it pops up here at the top. Um, we can create a grid, and here you can see that the, why the coordinate reference system becomes important. Um, because every it, by default it requires the grid size to be in degrees, which is very hard to reason about. So we're going to select an appropriate a coordinate reference system. Um, again, I won't go into that too much. You can there's a lot of resources to learn about that, but you can see that it switches to meters here, um, and we're going to use 500 a 500 meter um, size, which I've thought about a little bit and seemed reasonable. Uh, for the extent, by default, we create a grid that covers the entire world, and that would be very big and uh, and, um, and unwieldy. So we calculate that from our layer, um, and then we have this one here. So when we select that layer, it will basically say, "Okay, well, here's here's the extent of the layer. So this is how much how much um, of the world my layer takes up, and then the grid will only cover that part." We're going to start with a hexagon. I think those are always interesting shapes. Um, and then I can, I can run that and it will very quickly create this hexagon layer. Um, so it will cover the map. You can, you can interact with these layers and drag them so, so, they're, so, they're, so they're beneath everything else, but we'll keep them on top for now. And you can see here that the, lay, that the grid is only covers this, 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 little, this little area. Okay, we have a grid. So now, um, the next thing we'll do is like, we want to aggregate all the data per grid cell. So what we want to do is basically say, okay, here's one grid cell. How, uh, what is the length of the total of length of, of all the footpaths in that grid cell, right? So that what we call aggregation. So for each grid cell, we, end up, we will end up with one number that is the length, uh, that is the total aggregated length is computed, the sum of the lengths of, of all the different individual footpaths here. Um, so again, we head to the processing toolbox um, and we say length. And there's a lot of tools in here. So this search bar is often super useful. Um, and we find this tool called sum line lengths. So we're gonna use that um, for the base. We're going to use this grid, use gonna use this, uh, this grid that we already have. Um, and for the lines, we're going to use the foot weight. Some of them appear duplicate just because I've, and when I was when I was preparing this, I already had these layers. So they'll appear twice. Um, I didn't have time to clean that up beforehand. So if we run that, that's pretty quick for this small data set. Um, and nothing visual. Well, something happens. There basically a, a copy is made of that original grid layer that, and you see that it has a different color. Um, so you can see that the old one still exists if you deselect the new one. The difference though is that now we'll have a, if we click on this, if we zoom in a little bit, when we click on one of the cells, you will see that there is a length property for each of them and, it, and it's different for each of them, right? So here's 910 meters. This is this is in meters because we chose that coordinate system uh, that has has the length in meters. And it's also useful in this part, in this, in this respect. So, um, we have that we have that information now. So now we can think about okay, what we'll do with that? How do we make this grid look interesting um, based on this data that we've aggregated? Um, one thing I skipped over is like the, when data sets are very small, very small, this this doesn't matter. But if you work with bigger chunks of data, you would want to create a spatial index first. And there's a there's a toolbox uh, there's a toolbox um, function for that as well. Uh, that what that does is it basically creates a way for QJS to quickly look up individual features and operate on them, uh, rather than do a dumb um, like it, well, rather than do a dumb lookup where it has to basically look at all the features 
in one layer and all the features in another layer and figure out which one belong to which. Um, indexing helps speed that up. And we all need that today though, but I wanted you to know that it exists. Um, I want to stop here for just a moment um, to make sure that I'm catching any questions. Let's see if there's a chat. Okay, yeah, this is all. <laughs> okay, um, one meter is about three freedom units. And awesome, yes, that's about right. Um, so one kilometer is about, I think, 0.6 of a mile. Um, and and one yard, I don't even know how to reason about that, but you can figure that out. All right, no questions yet. Uh, again, feel free to interrupt. So now that we have that grid, right? Um, and time check, oh, I'm at 11.30, time flies. Um, I'll be able to do this though. Um, so we'll have to think about symbology, right? How do we visualize what we, what we um, the information that we have? Um, what we're going to try first is 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 what the GIS people call 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 a choropleth map, right? Where we basically map the values, those lengths that we just computed, uh, to colors. Um, and you can see an example here: uh, the world, um, um, uh, I, some unknown property of each country is mapped onto a color. So usually, darker colors mean more of the thing; lighter colors mean less of the thing. So that's what a choropleth map is. Um, and so you see, you see that this example map here uses blue grade a, a blue gradient, and you have to be careful to choose. Like there's very there's, QGIS has a ton of presets for these, um, and you want to think about what is the appropriate color color ramp, right? This is what we call a color ramp. It goes from white to dark blue, or it goes from red to red via like a rainbow color map. Um, and it depends on what kind of data you have. Um, in, this, in this case, we have a length, right? Which is a, what we call a quantitative data set. So it goes from zero to whatever. Um, and it has like a, and 10 is more than eight and 100 is more than 50. So that's, that's basically a, um, a quantitative data set where we, where, we have, where we deal with amounts that are relative to each other. Um, be, wary, be wary of the rainbows. Yes, indeed. Um, they look attractive, but they're not always relevant, and it can make make the reading the result very confusing. Um, so this is something. There's a whole science behind this. These color ramps are no accident. Um, these are very carefully constructed, and there is science behind it. Um, but you um, basically what you need to know is you have to choose an appropriate one, and there's often an instinctive um, an instinct that you will build as you do more of this. Um, to determine what appropriate is. And there's no easy answers. It's just, again, it's just a lot of experimentation at first. Um, and then you can go down a deep, deep rabbit hole about color maps, uh, color ramps, color maps that are so often used interchangeably. Um, the other type of data is qualitative, right? Where you have a certain data points that have nothing to do with each other in terms of relative size. But are, for example, what is your favorite pet? Is it a cat, a dog, a parrot, or a mouse? Um, th those are cat. Th those are qualitative data sets where you have like, different categories that that don't have a sort of a, a numeric relation to each other. One is not bigger than the other, or smaller than the other. In this case, we have qu quantitative data. Um, thanks for all the all the extra links, guys. Um, uh, this is useful for uh, for for uh, sort of getting more in depth. And I was hoping that that would uh, that would be. Uh, that some people would have more knowledge about than me about some of these things. Okay, we need to think, think about not only the color map itself, but also uh, how we, uh, which values we map to which colors, right? And there's a, uh, that's, um, that's sort of the classification part. And that's another sort of uh, thing with whole a whole body of science behind it. We'll try and keep it simple today and skip over a lot of those details to get some interesting looking results. Okay, let's get to the styling part. Um, the uh, um, or this we have like uh, let me let me go back to QGIS. So we have this layer. It looks like every cell looks the same, right? We haven't done we haven't done any any styling yet. So what happens is we click on this layer or we double click on it, in fact, and then this thing will pop up with all these things you can do to look at what this layer is doing, what the basic information about it. Um, um, you can do you can manipulate which which fields it has. You can do all kinds of database joins you can you can look at the metadata like tons of things um we will only look at symbology today that's what i was just talking about right 
Um, and this is this is a very powerful and at the beginning somewhat confusing interface, um, but it's like it lets us do a lot of different things. By default, when you load something, it will create a very simple style, just basically the same color for everything. Uh, QGIS will ch choose something at random, um, and you can you can change that by going to this menu. All right, we will use a graduated uh, a style because um, so there is these two differences, right? These two different types of data. Categorize is usually what you use for one qual qualitative data, whereas graduated you 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 have a range of values that you want to you know, that you want to visualize. Um, so we're going to use uh, use that. Um, then the second step is choose this 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 classification right? how do you map individuals values to 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 different sort of colors um, and there's many different ways to do that um, there um, so again there's a whole science behind this what I like to start with is this is this natural breaks classification right this is basically something that will make um, um, and I'm going to butcher this. The, um, this 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 is something that will make the the distributions um, um, basically look natural. Like I'm I'm not even going to try and define it. I've read about it a little bit, and I was hope I was going to be able to explain it better. Um, but it makes the it it makes for a sort of a natural distribution of values over the over the entire range of the sort of the minimum and maximum of our of our uh, of our data set basically. Because the, the minimum will probably be zero because some of these some of these cells will have no footpaths, and the maximum might be ten thousand for ten thousand meters worth of footpaths. Maybe it's less. We haven't really looked at that. So once we've chosen this color ramp, and we'll stick with the default here, sort of white to red. Um, again, there's tons of different presets that you can use. Um, I would I would I would recommend keeping it simple and try the try the default first. Um, and then start experimenting. You can always go back to this and and do it differently. Um, oh, we have to we have to choose a value. So what do we want to uh, symbolize, right? What do we want to show? Um, and in this case, oh, I didn't I do the sum lengths yet? Oh, I, I'm choosing the wrong layer. This is the this is the dumb grid. So that made it like I said, it made a copy, right? And um, to, with the with the additional values of the line length and the number and the count of footpaths as well. So we need to double click this one, and then we'll see um, if we choose graduated, um, and we'll see this, this, these additional two values, right? We see length and we see count. So count we're not going to look at that, just the, the number of features in each in each um, cell, number of footpath items. Uh, we are interested in the length, so we choose that. Um, like I said, we choose this default color ramp, and we'll choose uh, natural breaks for our classification. I will compute those breaks, right? So you'll see that there's now five. You can increase it, but I like to start with uh, five. is a, is is decent if you have, because if you choose too many, um, it will become very hard to to make out like the the deep. Uh, like, it will become very hard to sort of reason about uh, the individual um, the individual um, colors, right? So this creates um, a limited number of colors that will make it easy to um, sort of distinguish between cells with very few and cells with, cells with the many um, uh, a great length of footpaths. So when you click apply, you see if we zoom out uh, that we'll have this nice looking um, this this nice looking uh, so here's our result. Basically, we should be happy that we have this. So you see, dark red means lots of footpaths, um, light or white means no footpaths, and everything in between represents a represents a um, um, an intermediate level. And I think this, I mean, for a first run, this looks this looks pretty good. You can see that, for example, if you click, if you deselect this, you can see that. Oh, if you deselect this, you can see that where the I-15 freeway is, that area, you can see that generally those will have fewer uh, footpaths, whereas like in areas where there's uh, downtown and the neighborhood where I live, um, there's a lot of walkability, so that has a lot of footpaths. So this is the kind of data that you could unearth um, using, uh, using this kind of visualization. Again, though, it depends on the completeness and what mappers have contributed, right? So what are you really showing here? You're showing the density as it is represented in OSM that not necessarily is the same as the density in the real world. Uh, so that's a big caveat, right? Um, that you have to be aware of. If you would do this um, 
with a data set that you know to be sort of complete or authoritative. For example, you have something for this from the city uh, GIS that has all the footpaths um, it's, and it's guaranteed to be complete, quote unquote, which is like, I don't, I don't always believe, but uh, then you would have it, you might look at a different picture. Okay, so this is what I just did. Um, this is the result that we are looking at. Um, I'm like, what I needed to do to sort of relate that to the actual um, sort of the real world is to is to select and deselect. So I had to turn off this layer to see, okay, this is where that is. And if I zoom in, it becomes completely unclear where I am. So I have to keep clicking and uh, to see where I, where on the map I actually am. Um, there's a few ways around that. You can play a little bit with transparency in that same menu, right? You can put that at 50, for example, or around 50. And then you see some of the underlying underlying uh, map and it makes it a little easier, but it becomes kind of messy. So I'm not really happy with this um, in the end. Uh, so I, I want to try something different. Uh, like this, this is this is like a covering layer. It, it, every part of the underlying map is covered with some information layer, uh, which sort of makes it very hard to, to to kind of read. You have to zoom. If you zoom in far enough, it, it's sort of easy. Uh, if you zoom out, it's, it still is very hard to see and, and the, the information itself becomes sort of diluted as well. So I'm not happy with this. Um, and this is the part where sort of experimentation and a little bit of background if, if to what possible, what's possible becomes, becomes, comes in handy. So you have to, you have to have some, um, like, what, like, I said, like I said, I'm giving you some of the tools, but it requires a lot of sort of um, building of experience, trying things out, uh, doing things one way and trying to do them one other. Uh, to to figure out what a good visualization is for you. Right. Um, let's try something else. So I have another I have another trick up my sleeve um, to make this. So what I, the problem that I was seeing is like okay this layer covers the entire map especially if you're if you don't do this um, this opacity thing um, it's it's impossible to see where you are uh, on the, on the map if you just look at this information. So what we want is a layer that doesn't really cover uh, this entire map. So what I did is I started, um, basically I just started Googling to see um, like what are some of the alternatives, right? And what I came up with is what was nice is like maybe we can do something that's more point-based, right? Each, instead of each cell, we make one point for each cell and make them the size of the point be relative to this, to the length of the footpaths. And that, that, that looked pretty easy to do. So we're gonna do that next as a sort of a next iteration of our map, right? And that would that would in the end will end up with something like this. And I think you you probably agree that this is more intuitive to read. You can see the neighborhoods, you can see the main roads, and you can you you still see the sort of the the spatial context, if you will. Like well, where am I on the map? Um, and and you can immediately see better see where the hotspots are, right? So you can see here. This is actually where state of the map U.S. will happen next summer. <laughs> this is the university. And you can see that there's uh, tons of footpaths here, which you probably would expect, right? The, the, the university campus is a pedestrian area. There's not a lot of traffic and there's lots of footpaths to go from building to building, et cetera. So this is not really surprising. Um, so, and, and on top of that, it becomes now very easy to see that's where we are. Uh, so what we can do is we can uh, we can set the radius of the circle to represent the, val the underlying value of the data, right? But first we will have to make the points. Um, so what those points what what we want is a representative point for each of those hexagons, and and in GIS terms those things are um, one important one one way to think about that is what is the center or the centroid of the point. Um, the mathematical way to calculate that is. It's kind of out of the scope, but what you what you need to remember about that is that it's basically you can see it as a representative point um, of the feature. And our in our case, the features are all the same size; they're hexagons, so the centroid should should um, that should fit right in the center. If you work with more um, more complex polygons, the centroid can actually fall outside of the shape, so then it becomes a lot more complicated. But we're working with relatively simple uh, data. Don't check eleven forty five. Eek. <laughs> Um, we'll do this though. So generating centroid. So there's there's the processing toolbox again. Um, so we, we we go to the search and we go to centroid, and um, we see that there's various functions. 
Well, we choose the vector geometry centroids one. Um, there's there's a there's a few of there's a few other ones which we won't we won't go into these. Uh, point on surface is, for example, will guarantee that there is a point that is on the surface of the polygon, whereas the centroid is not always. Um, for our purpose, we just use centroids. Um, but as the input layer, we use the, the line length um, hexagons that we already have. So we will create a, a point that is basically at the center of each of those hexagons. And what it will do is create yet another layer, if we run this, with points. So you can see the, there is a, there's a, the same number of points as we had hexagons, and they all have a default style that is, that is very boring. Um, and what's nice about it is that if we zoom in and we click on one of these layers, you can see, well, let's click on one with data in it, um, that the value of the count here for the hexagon is 12. And you can see if you click on the point, that the value is all, that value is being copied over, right? Because we based it on the, the, the layer that already had these values. All right, so we have this basic information um, that is already attached to these points. So that's cool. Um, so now we have to think about styling yet again, right? So how do we style this? And this is work. In this case, it works a little bit differently um, because we don't want to. We don't want all these small points because it's going to be completely invisible. Let's actually turn off the previous line that we worked with, previous layer. Um, so this, when you zoom out, this is worthless, right? There's no information visible in these points. Okay, so we double click like we did before um, on this on the um, on the layer to, to start to style it. We click on symbology if it's not already selected. Um, we keep this at a single symbol. So all the symbols, so the, the, the way these is, uh, the way the data is represented um, in terms of the in terms of the shape um, is just is just a point. What we want is we want to have different sizes uh, for each for each of the values. So you see here, um, you can you can set a size. You can set this to ten, for example, and you can click OK, and you have set cells with tens with ten. Uh, I think it's millimeters, right? I forget. Um, this is still doesn't have any information attached to it. So we need to think of something different. How can we make this size um, representative of that value length that we that we that we uh, that we were talking about before um, that we want to visualize basically. So that for that we click on this tiny little menu here that's almost invisible, which is actually really important for us. Um, I don't know why it's so small. It always bums me out. Um, and then we can go to edit, and that that brings up a what we call an expression builder. And here it's where it gets where it gets where it gets. Um, where we have to actually sort of start thinking a little bit, a little bit more advanced about how where these values are and how we come to interact with it. Um, so here's a this is the list of sort of operations. It's all categorized. There's a whole ton of operations that you can do on each value of the um, of the of the feature that you have. So we're looking at the length, right? So we're going to fields and values. So these are the fields that are associated with each of the features in this layer. And we see that length is among them. So we double click that and we do length. Um, okay, so now if we click okay, um, then each, the size of each feature will have a length or a, a size that is that is the same as the length of the of the of the footways of the footpaths in each of them. So if we click okay, whoa. So we have circles that are <laughs> that are huge, right? We can zoom out and keep zooming out. So and if we zoom out, we see that we're already um, basically at half of the United States and the circles are like bigger than the United States. So that's pretty worthless. Um, so we have to think about what that size means. Um, and the, uh, the other recording is being made. Uh, I think it will be on YouTube. You can check the Slack channel. Um, so th just to round this out, so uh, the size is, that's worthless. So. If we look at, if we turn this layer off for a moment, or, we, or if we just click on one of the one of the features, we can do that. Uh oh. And see, this is QGIS has a tendency to sometimes, well, not crash, <laughs> but then it will just sort of freeze and sometimes crash. 
Uh, so I hope that doesn't happen to me. But in the meantime, I'll go back to my slides, uh, so I can. So you can, um, like I said, you can, you can, you can, you can um, select that little eight minute warning. Okay, we can select that little thing that I just did and right before my QGIS has crashed or froze. And then what you get is this expression builder. And you can choose from a ton of different operators and fields. So you have the fields and values um, where you can choose, okay, this is the field, um, the data feature, the data in the inside the feature that I want to visualize. And then you can make, you can operate on that feature with using this expression builder. And in this case, I tried dividing it, right? I started with a thousand um, because I was thinking this length is in meters, right? And the cells are 500 meters. So the length should probably not more be more than 10,000 or something. Um, so it was, I was kind of doing a little bit of common sense reasoning. I was like, no, well, let's start with thousand and then see where I am. So with a thousand, it was still, let me see, no, my QTS is still frozen. Um, so it's, long story short, I started experimenting with these sizes and came up with 500 as a reasonable uh, size. So basically you any length of the of any of those points, the length, it'll take the length which can be like uh, a thousand, for example, thousand meters worth of footpaths, and divide that by five hundred, which which ends up with like a two millimeter or two point. Um, if we had the what, what do we have for sizes units? If I go back, yeah, it's points. So points on the map or points on the screen, basically. So um, so if if the length would be a thousand, the the the, the circle would be two points big. Um, and if the length is 10,000, it will be 20 points big. Uh, so what we end up then here is kind of what we what I showed you just now, um, this, this map. And I think this result looks way, way better, right? So we can still see the underlying map and we can still see the um, uh, see like where you are. You can orient yourself and you get a better, much better sort of intuitive sense of um, of uh, of of sort of what the what of what the data represents. So I'm pretty happy with this. Like this is not bad for an hour's work. Um, there's of course many like what I've given you right now, and it's like we're already sort of at the end of this. I was hoping to sort of go into the uh, Python stuff as well, and and I'm happy to um, just not like not today. Um, but you can you can you can do this for like with following the steps that I just laid out. You can do this for yourself. Uh, you can download QJS. We can query this OSM data. We have the building blocks now, right, to do this. Uh, we can install this plugin, Quick OSM. We can query footpaths. We can query shops. We can query hospitals. And using these presets, you don't even have to know much about the tags uh, in OSM, which can be a messy knowledge area. Um, and you can as you can just choose a different city, uh, right? You can choose your own city. You can try something bigger. Not probably not an entire country that will. Uh, that will uh, that will be hard to um, download uh, from the OSM server. It's just it's too much data, and that it will probably just say no. <laughs> to be quite honest, um, and uh, you can query yeah, like you can query your own area and do your own. Um, so you can start with the examples that I did, but you can also uh, look at that symbology menu. Is my QJS unfrozen yet? No, I don't think it will. So what I have to do then is like I can't I can't show you, but I can I have to basically quit the quit the QJS application and start it again. And then all my so the, here's a here's a final point that I want to make. One thing I didn't do and you should always do is save your work or often, right? I didn't do this, and now when I will open QJS again, I'll start with an empty screen. Um, so you should always save this at after every step that you did that you do, and this is the best sort of reason I can give you why because QJS, as awesome as it is, will crash sometimes, <laughs> and then your work is gone. Um, so please, please save, save uh, because uh, QJS won't do it for you, um, and uh, and it's super important. So now all my work is lost. Fortunately, I have my own slides, so I can reproduce it. Um, yeah, I won't have time for this. Uh, this is a whole nother area that I would love to explore. Uh, I did a little bit of exploration with it. Um, I won't have time for it today. I, I was kind of wondering if I would, um, and it's also it's a whole nother topic, so it's kind of um, very ambitious to try and do both. Um, I might do it for State of the Map US, perhaps, um, in the uh, 
in the um uh, the, the the conference this summer um but um but um, yeah there's there's people much more qualified to do a workshop like that but i enjoyed learning about it a little bit um but yeah so i want to leave it here uh, these are like your first your first steps on the uh, visualizing osm data and doing a little bit of like very straightforward analysis on it um is uh, our, our awesome first steps to take and from there on there's a ton of learning resources and I'll add some to the slides. Uh, like what is what are the next steps after this, right? Where can you go and learn more? Uh, I have a bunch of resources that I'll add to the to the to the to the uh, to this slide deck before I share it with you. I um, hope you can I hope you can sort of continue on your learning journey uh, on your own. Um, uh, or you can ask it in the in the OSM US Slack channel. It's not there's a bunch of JS people there that are probably happy to help.